Do not get me started on Rush. I will not shut up about them. Today I'm going to talk about building a culture of analytics. And as Jeff mentioned, my name is Phil, and I've written a bunch of books. They're all in general about data, technology, business, and people. I already messed up. Ian, sorry about that. Good to go? OK. As they say in Spanish, whatever doesn't kill me makes me fat. <laughs> the most, bi most recent book is about business communication. It's called Message Not Received. And I speak and consult and, and generally considered a fairly knowledgeable person about technology. And as Jeff mentioned, I'm a big fan of the show Breaking Bad. Show of hands, any Breaking Bad fans out there? Nice. OK, for those of you who don't know, the show is about Walter White, played by Brian Cranston. And he's a 50-year-old high school chemistry teacher who makes $43,000 a year. His wife is pregnant with an unexpected kid, and his oldest son has cerebral palsy. He finds out that he has terminal lung cancer and six months to live. To provide for his family, he does what any good chemistry teacher does, and he starts manufacturing crystal meth. And I bring this up because I'm going to tie in Breaking Bad and shows like that Shows about morally ambiguous characters, shows about good people who do bad things or bad people who do good things into cultures of analytics. And I'm going to bring up some really interesting numbers on a little company called Netflix. But just to prove to you what a breaking bad nut I am, this is me as Heisenberg for Halloween. <laughs> and this is one of my prized possessions. It's a season one autographed DVD by Vince Gilligan, the showrunner and Anna Gunn, who plays the lead actress, Skylar White. So during this talk, I'm going to discuss companies that have built cultures of analytics. And a word of caution, I'm a big fan of pop culture references. If you wouldn't mind, just make sure that your smartphones are put to silent. And today, my topic will be content from my most recent two books, The Visual Organization and Message Not Received. Here's the plan of attack. Quick trivia, what movie is this? It's an obscure one. Nope. Miller's Crossing. Today I'm going to speak for around 50 minutes and then answer as many questions as I can. And then I'll hang out afterwards. I believe that each one of you is getting a copy of book number six, The Visual Organization. So thank you, SAS, for that. What will you learn today? Well, high level, I centered this talk around five questions. What is a culture of analytics? Why is building one so important today? Who's actually doing this? Many people talk about the importance of big data and analytics, but who's actually walking the talk? How are they doing it? What can you learn from them? And then, what did this all mean for the future? Where are we going? Let's start with a simple question. Why is culture so important? Allow me to offer an extremely simplistic view of management. Management consultants are often fond of saying things like it's all about execution. OK, let's think about it for a minute. What if you're executing on the wrong strategy? That's not a good thing. This happens all the time. Let's go back in time to 1997 and a couple of really smart Stanford academics named Larry Page and Sergey Brin were working on technology that would revolutionize search. Does anyone remember search engines like All the Web, Lycos, Yahoo, back in 1997, 98? Raise your hand. Search was terrible. And a couple of guys named Larry and Sergey invented technology that would make search not just 10% better, but 10 times or 100 times better. But Larry and Sergey didn't want to start a company. They wanted to sell their technology. Their parents were academics. They wanted to teach in schools. And they were pitching their technology to companies like Excited Home, remember them, and Yahoo. And you know how much they wanted? 1.5 million with an M. But Yahoo's management on the time saw the future, and their strategy wasn't about search. Search was dead as far as they were concerned. Their strategy was about portals. No one talks about portals anymore. So for $1.5 million, they could have bought the technology that's behind Google. Anyone know Google's market cap today? 
It's around $450 billion last time I checked. Anyone know Yahoo's? It's around $22 billion. So execution only gets you so far. Strategy is important. Who would say otherwise? Well, strategy might not be the most important thing. One of my favorite business quotes comes from the management guru, Peter Drucker, who famously said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So if you think about it, you could argue that culture is more important than strategy, and strategy is more important than execution. Now, I'm being simple here. All of these things are important. If you don't execute, even if you have the right strategy, bad things can happen. But my point is that culture is often overlooked. And some of the companies I'll talk about today have really adopted cultures of analytics. I'm trying to stress the general importance of culture. But what specifically is a culture of analytics? To me, success begins with a common understanding of terms. I've Googled that quote, and it sounds like something Winston Churchill will say. I don't think he said it, so I might have to take credit for that one. What are we talking about here with a culture of analytics? And quite simply, in putting this talk together, I came up with the shortest definition possible. It's one in which most business decisions rely upon data, modeling, experiments, and analysis. Now, a few disclaimers here. Does this mean that every business decision is based on data and analytics? Of course not. If you haven't figured it out already, I'm a big fan of quotes. Here are two of my favorites. Henry Ford famously said a long time ago that you can't, excuse me, that if you ask customers what they want, they'll tell you a better horse. Steve Jobs famously said, you can't ask customers what they want, you have to tell them. Before she ran Google, I'm sorry, Yahoo, Marissa Meyer worked at Google, and she was very smart, but she routinely irritated a lot of designers. Because if you're a designer, you take a lot of pride in your craft. But you don't necessarily want 20 different thousand versions of your design split tested. And that's exactly what she did. And certain designers famously quit Yahoo because they didn't want data driving a lot of their decisions. So these are polar opposites. I'm trying to make the case that there's a happy medium. There is a place for data and analytics when it comes to making business decisions. In fact, I'd argue that most business decisions are better made if you bring in data. Perhaps a culture of analytics is best thought of as its opposite. Who's with me here? One of my all-time favorite episodes. George does the absolute opposite on Seinfeld and good things happen. And when I started my career after grad school, I worked in an organization, a Fortune 50 company. I won't name the name, but we'll call it Acme here. And a friend of mine early on there had asked me, hey, Phil, I've got this project from the head of recruiting. You seem to be good with data and analysis. Help me out. Sure, what's the project? The head of recruiting wanted her to run the numbers and assess how viable it was for the company to continue to recruit at Ivy League schools. In other words, was the squeeze worth the juice? Now, by way of background, I have nothing against Ivy League schools. My master's is from Cornell, which is part of the Ivy League. But to me, that was irrelevant. This was a business question. So I ran some numbers, created a model, and it wasn't even close. We were spending $400,000 or $500,000 to get a single recruit from a Harvard or a Columbia, and that person would typically stay with the company for a year, 18 months, versus recruiting at state schools like the university, like Rutgers University in New Jersey, the state school. And those people didn't require the same recruiting costs. They surely didn't make the same salary, and they wound up staying much, much longer and being promoted. By all accounts, they were better employees. When I took this to my friend and we presented it to the head of recruiting, his answer was very simple. But I like recruiting at Ivy League schools. So don't ask the question. That is not a culture of analytics. I thought that it was an isolated event until a few months later I attended a meeting about employee turnover. And our turnover codes throughout the globe, this was a massive company with over 60,000 employees, were quite frankly a mess. We wanted to standardize them, right? To compare apples to apples. Maybe people in Singapore were leaving the company for similar reasons the people in the United States, but we couldn't tell because the data was a mess. And a director at the company got up and said, I don't need data to tell me while people were leaving. This is not a culture of analytics. And when thinking about one, I know the statisticians will enjoy this, don't think of it in terms of a binary. In fact, it's a continuum. This doesn't mean that all business decisions are made on the basis of data. Again, there is 
something to be said for leadership, for innovation, for taking risks that the data don't necessarily support. But these days, more companies are erring on the side of using data. As John mentioned before, even traditional industries like baseball, if you look at the Oakland A's, Billy Bean, Houston Astros, I was talking to Sig earlier, they are understanding the importance of data and analytics. So now that I've defined my terms, let's think for a minute about why building a culture of data and analytics is more important than ever. Kind of the big question, right? Hasn't this always been important to build a culture of data analytics? What has changed, and why is this more critical than ever? To make a long story short, a culture of analytics allows organizations to react quicker than if they only rely upon gut feel. They can answer mission-critical questions such as, how are we really doing? What types of problems are on the horizon? Are we on track? Where are we falling short? Are we paying attention to the right things? Is our company experimenting enough? And can we work smarter? If so, then how? Now, again, make no mistake, these types of questions have always been important, but they've never been more essential to ask. A culture of analytics is becoming table stakes in many organizations. Why do I think so? Let's take a step back. Where are we now? I want to provide a very brief overview at today's business landscape, because I think that in many ways it's very different than that even five, 10 years ago. What do we know now? Well, several things. We know that the era of big data has arrived. Does anyone here doubt it? Yet, I would argue we were still in the first inning. We are just beginning to understand the impact of these massive streams of data coming at us faster than ever, not only on business, but on society at large. What else do we know? Well, we know that we are adopting new technologies faster and faster than ever. But don't take my word for it. Here's another one of my favorite business quotes. Anyone recognize this guy? Demings, Demings very nice. W. Edward Demings, for those of you who don't know, was an American engineer, professor, author, and management consultant. And he famously said, in God we trust, all others must bring data. Last year, The Economist looked at some numbers on the rate of technological change, and it compared different technologies over time. It looked at the telephone and the television and the increasingly rapid adoption of US technologies. It wanted to know how long it took a quarter of the American population to adopt these new tools. The results were absolutely fascinating. Electricity took 46 years. OK, that's kind of our benchmark. Next up, the telephone, 35 years. The radio took 31 years for a quarter of the American population to adopt it. Anyone noticing a trend here? 26 years for television. And then things really start to pick up. Personal computer, the PC, only 16 years. Mobile phones, 13 years. And then finally, the World Wide Web took only seven years. So we know for a fact that technological change is increasing. Things are happening faster than ever. We've all heard of companies explode like a Lyft or an Uber. And two or three years ago, we never even heard of them. In other words, the long term has never been shorter. Change is happening faster and faster than ever. And I'm hardly the only person to have noticed this. Anyone know who this is? This is Ray Kurzweil. He is one of the smartest people on the planet. Currently, he works for Google, but he's an inventor and a futurist. He's made some really interesting predictions over time. And a lot of them have come true. And he talks in his books about the rate of accelerating technological change. In other words, technological change is exponential, not linear. In other words, things don't go from one to two to three to four to five. Things go from one to two to four to eight to 16. And over time, little things become very big things. This is a very big deal. This distinction is not a semantic one. What does this mean for the world of business? Disruption today is happening faster than ever. 
this trend shows no signs of abating. For instance, does anyone know who invented digital film and what year? It's one of my most interesting stats of the day. In 1975, so 40 years ago, somebody from Kodak said, we can do digital film. Raise your hand if you own a Kodak product. OK, so we've got two, three. The company that invented digital film is a rounding error out there. In fact, if you look at it last time I checked, Kodak is currently in bankruptcy proceedings. It is selling its patents to, I believe, Apple. Yet I guarantee you that many of you use the core technology behind Kodak every day to take pictures. Anyone been to a Blockbuster video lately? This is only intensifying. The hotel industry is justifiably scared of companies like Airbnb. The taxi industry doesn't know what to do with companies like Uber and Lyft. By the way, they have Uber in San Diego, right? Think so? How pervasive could this disruption be? Very. And this ties in nicely to something John mentioned earlier about the innovator's dilemma. This is Clayton Christensen's book about disruptive technologies. And this tie very, ties very much into what Ray Kurzweil believes. Little changes eventually become big changes. And companies are too quick to dismiss these little changes. Right? There's a reason that many of you haven't been into a blockbuster lately. This change could be so pervasive that this man, John Chambers, up until recently, the CEO of Cisco Systems, he just retired, and he told an audience in one of his last talks as CEO that 40% of businesses back in June won't be around in a meaningful way in 10 years. This should make you sweat. And no business talk would be complete without a quote from this guy. Perhaps the solution to the innovator's dilemma is to potentially cannibalize yourself. That's what Steve Jobs thought, and on most things, he tended to be right. But this is a very difficult line to sell if you work in Kodak. We should blow up our business. What are you talking about? So the answer is typically a human one in building a culture of analytics. And I would argue that the culture of analytics is becoming more essential. Has anyone ever heard of the diamond water paradox? OK. I remember learning this in grad school, and it was fascinating to me. Diamonds are worth a lot of money, but do you really need one to survive? You probably need one for a happy marriage, but that's a different discussion. Water is essentially free, and try living without it. I would argue that a culture of analytics is becoming much more like water and much less like a diamond. One is imperative for survival. The other is kind of nice to have. Maybe 10 or 15 years ago, if you were strong in analytics, you could get by, maybe even have some level of success. But these days, as we've seen with many organizations, adopting new technologies and making decisions based on data, it's never been more important. There's a reason that. Has anyone ever read anything from Nate Silver? Signal and Noise, fascinating book. At one point, he was responsible when he worked for the New York Times for 20% of the Times traffic. It's an astonishing number from a guy who was a statistician. So I do think that the geeks have inherited the earth. And a culture of innovation, I'll argue today, can help spur innovation. It can minimize the effects of potential disruption. And it may even prevent obsolescence and perhaps even eventual distinction. So with that background, who's doing it, right? Who has successfully embraced a culture of analytics? Before I answer that, let me go back to something that I think about a lot. And this is my extremely simplistic view of the world applied to companies with cultures of analytics. And at a very high level, I think that there are three types of organizations. Those that get it, those that don't get it but want to get it, and then those that don't get it and don't want to get it. I don't have a lot of faith in the survival, let alone excess, success, of that third group. Well, let's focus for a moment on that first group, which organizations get it. Who's ahead of the game? In this era of big data, no doubt there are, to be sure, winners and losers. And I'll argue today that four companies that are absolutely killing it are Amazon, Netflix, Facebook, and Google. It's amazing how much they know about their users and their customers. Now let's start with Amazon. If you go into Amazon and you search for Breaking Bad, 
not only do you get the results, but you're going to get relevant product recommendations. Early on, I talked about the show and gave, for those of you not familiar with it, a summary of it because it is a morally complex show. Again, good people do bad things, bad people do good things. If you watch the show initially, you may hate one character and then come to like him or her. And the shows that Amazon recommends have very similar thematic content. Contrast that with other sites that didn't use data and analytics that way. I remember two or three years ago, I was researching one of my books, and I went to different e-commerce sites and typed in Breaking Bad. And I believe it was Buy.com that gave me, as a similar product recommendation, the Bad News Bears. Now, full disclosure, as a kid, the original Bad News Bears movie with Walter Matthau was one of my favorites. But a movie about a ragtag bunch of misfits playing baseball doesn't really have a lot to do with a guy who's facing death and wants to provide for his family and essentially becomes a drug kingpin. The only commonality, the word bad. This is Amazon CEO and founder Jeff Bezos on 60 Minutes about two years ago. Did anyone see that show when he talked about drone-based delivery? I'm sure you could find it online, but it was absolutely fascinating. And there are still some major legislative hurdles to clear, but eventually Amazon sees a future in which DHL or UPS or the post office doesn't deliver products to you. Drones will. We're not there yet, but it's a possibility. And Charlie Rose asked Jeff Bezos flat out, would this even work with Amazon's inventory? Brad Stone wrote an excellent book on Amazon called The Everything Store. If you want to search for something, you'd be hard pressed to find it, not find it on Amazon. They call it the everything store for a reason. And with all that inventory, when Charlie Rose asked him that question, Jeff Bezos didn't bat an eye and said, this would work for 72% of our products because that's the percentage that weigh under five pounds. And at present, drones can deliver up to five pounds. He didn't give an answer of, I don't know, or we're looking into it. He knew that number cold. And it's because Amazon knows its customer data, its product data so well, that it can do things like in 2014, file a patent for anticipatory commerce, which is just a fancy way of saying that Amazon's gonna know what you want to buy before you've clicked buy. You don't do that unless you understand how your business works. If Amazon is trying to roll out two hour delivery in Seattle or San Francisco, it can't very well ship in products from Florida, can it? So Amazon, I would argue, understands data and analytics perhaps second to none. But don't tell that to the folks at Netflix. Netflix is the key case study in the book you're all going to receive, the visual organization. And just as a show of hands, how many of you are Netflix customers? OK, a decent number. Same thing, if you type in Breaking Bad on Netflix, Netflix isn't giving you the bad news bears. It's giving you similar shows like House of Cars and The Killing and Damages, ones that blur the lines between good and bad, ones that are about anti-heroes. The Wire is a similar type of show, if those of you are fans. And Netflix can do this at an incredible scale. Last time I checked, the company sports around 67 million customers and a market cap of $43 billion, give or take. Now. Why is Netflix so successful? There are many reasons. The first off is plain old dumb luck. You haven't been to a blockbuster lately because they're out of business. But go back about 15 years when the dot-com bubble exploded. Netflix wasn't doing so well like a lot of companies. And Reed Hastings, the company's founder and CEO, needed a lifeline. He wanted to sell his technology to anyone who would buy it, particularly Blockbuster. And he only wanted $50 million, a number that Blockbuster could have easily afforded. John Antioco, at the time the head of Blockbuster, just like Yahoo back in 1997, saw the future. And in the future, why would you want to get DVDs in the mail? If you want to see a movie, you want to get it now. You want to run down to your video store and pick it up. Blockbuster passed on Netflix, and the rest is history. But Hastings was smart enough to know that eventually more of us would have mobile devices and broadband would become more pervasive. Of course you're not going to watch movies if you're constantly buffering. But Hastings called the company Netflix, not DVD by Nailflix. He eventually realized, like Steve Jobs said, that he would have to disrupt himself. And that's exactly what they did. 
But make no mistake, luck only gets you so far. Netflix has absolutely embraced a culture of analytics. And researching this book, I came across a fascinating three-part data credo at Netflix. First up, data is accessible, easy to discover, and easy to process for everyone. We're not just talking about data being available for executives on dashboards. At Netflix, almost everybody is numerate. In other words, we all understand the importance of being able to read and write at work, right? Try to get your job done if you're illiterate. But increasingly, employees need to be more numerate. Does that mean they're all power users, statisticians, and data scientists? Of course not. But there won't really be a place for you to hide if you're just not a numbers person. We can't just stick you in HR, and I have an example on that later. Netflix also realizes that it's downright silly and wholly inefficient to make IT the central report builder. We've all had this happen, right? Certainly I have in my career. I didn't have access to the data, so I'd put together a report request. Someone in IT would interpret it, and back and forth and back and forth. That process doesn't make any sense these days. Remember, speed kills. And this ties into the second part of the Netflix data credo. The longer you take to find the data, the less valuable it becomes. Again, this is very much in keeping with current trends. And the way I like to think of it, data is like milk. It tends to taste best when it's at its freshest. The third part of the credo very much ties into the central premise of this book. Whether a data set is large or small, being able to visualize it makes it much easier to explain. And this is just the way the human brain works. We can interpret things much faster if they are visualized, 60 to 60,000 times faster, depending on the brain and depending on the data. This is not simply, though, about putting data in Excel and creating a static pie chart or bar graph. Netflix builds interactive tools to help its employees make better decisions, diagnose technical problems, and understand its customers. Is this just an empty credo? It's a fair question. Right? Many CEOs will talk about people being their most important asset, and then you kind of find out that those words belie the company's actions. At Netflix, I'm fairly certain that this is legitimate. Meet Ted Sarandos. He is the head of content at Netflix, or more formally, Netflix's chief content officer. Now, truth be told, I'm not a fan of a lot of title inflation. But at Netflix, if you're chief content officer, it's a big deal. Here's why. If you look at Netflix's balance sheet, the company routinely spends about three to three and a half billion dollars per year on content, either creating its own, like House of Cards, which the first season, 13 episodes, cost $100 million to produce. Or the rights to a show like Breaking Bad or Mad Men. That costs a lot of money. If you're running content at Netflix, it's a big deal. And a couple years ago, Sarandos did an interview with a reporter who asked him, after House of Cards won the Emmy, aren't you afraid that you're spending $100 million on 13 episodes, and you're going to have a bunch of people who sign up, pay $8 per month, and then promptly quit? Much like Bezos when asked about drone delivery, delivery, Sarandos didn't bat an eye. And he said, no, only 20,000 of our customers did that. Now, let's put that number in context. 20,000 customers is a significant number. I don't have 20,000 customers. But on top of 67 million, it's a rounding error. So these companies are very in tune with what's going on in their business. And there are many more fascinating examples of Netflix data. And they would only share so much with me because they realize that this is proprietary information. But here's one of my favorites. 50,000 Netflix customers watched all of season three of Breaking Bad the day before season four premiered. Season three, one of my favorites, contains 13 episodes of around 40 to 42 minutes each. So that's about 10 hours worth of binge watching in one day, 50,000. So I ask you, does your organization know its customers this well? And if not, then why not? But this awareness of the importance of data and culture doesn't just exist at the top level of the organization at Netflix. It exists everywhere. In fact, as I learned, Netflix has won awards for its use of technology. Last year in San Jose, I went to Netflix to speak as part of my book tour for the visual organization. And I remember seeing something really interesting in the lobby. I thought, 
that these were Emmys from House of Cards because Netflix won, was the first non-TV network to win an Emmy. Different type of award. Netflix won, I'm not making this up, a technology Emmy. The company has won awards for its use of data and technology. And I know that all employees at Netflix understands the, understand the importance of data. If you go into Netflix headquarters, there are data visualizations on the wall. In fact, this is my favorite Netflix statistic. The company is responsible for a mind-boggling 34% of all US weeknight internet traffic, about a third. When I spoke at Netflix, I made a mistake. I got up in front of around 150 people and said that Netflix was responsible for one-fifth of all US internet traffic. And I might as well have insulted them, <laughs> because 100 people, give or take, immediately corrected me and in unison said one-third. I'm actually happy that I made the mistake, because it proves that they know the importance of data. Again, they're not all statisticians and data scientists, but they understand that data is really important. But even though Netflix chews up one-third of all US nighttime internet traffic, the company is still hungry for more data. This is fascinating to me. The company does two things that I think all organizations ought to consider. First up, it purchases third-party data and metadata from firms like Nielsen. It wants to understand its demographics better, what its customers would potentially like. That goes into the algorithm. But here's what gets really interesting. At Netflix, you can make money watching movies. The company will pay you to watch movies. Now, it's not saying, yeah, watch the movie, tell us what you think. No. Netflix is looking for very specific information that computer algorithms and data currently can't give us. For example, is a movie suspenseful? Is it funny? How funny? Those things are put in a very objective way, such that Netflix can serve up more relevant information. And that's essential for the company's business model. Remember, you don't sign a two-year contract with Netflix. This isn't Verizon or AT&T. If you want to skip Netflix because you're going to play golf in July and come back in August, go right ahead. So this is essential to the company's business model. Netflix knows an insane amount about the company. It's wicked smart. Who knows what movie this is? Goodwill Hunting, thank you, not as obscure. It knows what its customers watch, when its customers are watching. Did you hit pause for five seconds? Maybe you needed to check something, or did you hit pause and never come back to a movie? what particular point of the movie. It knows the devices on which you're watching. This isn't 1998. We're not all watching on DVD players with discs we got in the mail in those red envelopes. We're watching on our smartphones, on our tablets, on our computers, on our gaming consoles. There are hundreds of different devices ones, what people can use to watch Netflix con uh, content. And again, it knows when you're pausing and when you resume watching. It knows this on all of its customers. It can make customized recommendations. In fact, Netflix, last time I checked, categorizes movies into 76,000 different subgenres. Some of them are so incredibly uh, minuscule, you wouldn't believe it. You know, funny Indian films from the 1950s. It can give you recommendations based on who you are. It's not trying to put a square peg in a round hole. And with all this information on its customers, you'd have to be crazy to start a streaming company today. Now, what do Amazon, Netflix, Google, and Facebook have in common? Many things. Here are a few of them. First up, again, these companies at their senior levels understand the importance of data, the importance of analytics, the importance of technology. Remember, Hastings founded a DVD, DVD by mail business yet he called it Netflix. They understand that all employees need to be numerate. And I write for SAS, and on the Data Roundtable blog, if you're interested, I wrote a post about the importance of numeracy in the future. But these companies go wherever the data takes them. They are constantly questioning existing assumptions and promptly acting on these new findings, on these new data sources. For example, Anyone here ever heard of Amazon Web Services, AWS? Okay. For those of you who don't know, Amazon essentially invented the cloud computing business. Why should you host your own um, data centers or applications or databases when you can pay a company like Amazon that essentially lets its excess compute power vanish into the ether? In 2006, someone at Amazon said, why don't we try to sell that? 
Now think about Amazon's business up until then, selling books, selling DVDs, selling compact disks. What does a retailer know about cloud computing? It took a few years to figure it out, but Amazon had a four to five year head start on companies like IBM, Microsoft, and Google. They're all trying to sell cloud computing services. And for a company with razor thin margins, AWS makes about 85% pure profit, $6 billion per year business with a 50% growth rate because they were willing to listen to the data and to take a chance. These companies also bake proficiency with data and analytics into everything they do, including traditionally fuzzy processes such as hiring. Remember before when I talked about Acme Corporation and presenting data showing that we shouldn't recruit at the Ivy League? I found it very interesting that recently Laszlo Bach, Google's head of HR, did a couple of um, articles for Harvard Business Review and actually wrote a book about how Google conducts its human resources. And it found that this notion that you need to be properly educated was certainly true if you needed to be a marketing manager or some type of analyst. But if you were a programmer or a developer, you could have dropped out of high school. There was no correlation between being a successful employee at Google in a programming capacity and having gone to school. So the company ignores what some people would think is, is table stakes these days. The company, again, is willing to go where the data takes it. What else do these companies have in common? First up, they were all born in the net age, in the internet age, right? Amazon, Netflix, Facebook, Google. And this begs the question, does an organization need to be born in the internet age to get analytics? Or, as a sub-question, which mature companies have successfully ingrained analytics into their cultures? Who knows these guys, Sears? Sears was most certainly not born in the internet age. In fact, the company was founded in 1886. But in 2011, the company, in trying to compete with Amazon and companies that were taking advantage of what we call big data, it started playing around with Hadoop. And for those of you who haven't heard of it, it's basically an open source framework to handle um, up to petabytes of unstructured data. Sears launched something called Metascale. It realized that it could help other companies trying to make sense out of big data. So here is a traditional company that understands that the world is changing and you can't just rely on the old ways of doing things. It started a consulting practice. As John mentioned earlier, here's Billy Bean. He's the very quantitative general manager of baseball's Oakland Athletics. If you haven't read the book by Michael Lewis, it's excellent, or Brad Pitt paid, played him in the movie. And he irritated quite a few colleagues because he told them that their expertise in scouting was irrelevant. They needed to look at numbers. And Billy Bean was able to make the playoffs with a payroll the fraction of the size of big market teams like the New York Yankees or the Boston Red Sox. But clearly, not everybody gets it. And given what we know about today's rapid technological change, about this persistent threat of disruption, what will happen to companies that remain complacent? I'd argue very bad things. Some organizations, some industries just don't understand the importance of data. Some organizations and industries are on the outside looking in. They haven't cultivated these cultures, and they've done so at their own peril. For instance, here's an industry about which I know I like to think a decent amount, publishing and bookstores. Why are they in such serious trouble today? Fundamentally, they don't understand their customers. You think Amazon's going to share that information with them? Well, why would it? If I ran Penguin and O'Reilly and I know which one of you bought my books, then I can market to you directly and I can ignore those guys because they don't wind up doing that. Ten years ago, you would have been insane to suggest that bookstores or traditional publishers would go, would go away, but if you look at them, they're really struggling right now. And I would argue that their lack of understanding of their customers, their lack of data and analytics are a big part of that. Who would have thought that they would have gone the way of the dodo? But make no mistake, there are no guarantees in business, even if you understand the importance of data and analytics. Even successful tech companies can fall from grace. Anyone recognize this? Do me a favor, stand up if you ever owned a BlackBerry. I'm standing. Admit it. Okay, I would have thought a few more. Okay, remain standing if you still own a BlackBerry. <laughs> Nobody. Doesn't surprise me, want to know why? BlackBerry's market share is 0.5%, not a big number, even though at one point the company owned a virtual monopoly on smartphones. 
So how do you get started? How do you build a culture of analytics in your organization? What specifically can you do when you go back to work next week? Well, here are some lessons from the visual organization. I'm big on building these interactive tools, and we were talking about this at dinner last night. You don't necessarily want IT to be back in the middle of things, right? You want to let people discover things from yourself. As John mentioned, it's never been important to start with a null hypothesis or an idea, and then let the data take you in different places. And that is much easier if you're embracing interactive data visualization tools. Static pie charts and bar graphs only get you so far, and you have to remember your purpose. I run a small business. I don't need to give my accountant an interactive data viz tool. She just wants my P&L. But if I were trying to explore Amazon's 300 million customers, Excel's just not going to cut it. You want to encourage data discovery and exploration. You don't necessarily know where the data is going to take you. Right? When I was working on my fifth book, Too Big to Ignore, I went to my editor and said, I think this should be the title and this should be the cover, but I'm not sure. Can we split test it? Can I put separate web pages on my site and see which ones get more clicks? He said no, because he wanted to be the one with the answers. He didn't want to discover what the data had in mind. When I talk about interactive tools, here's a really interesting example from the book. And this comes from Justin Majeka, who's an employee based in Toronto for Autodesk, which makes computer-aided design software that architects or landscapers use. And he looked at the notion of a traditional org chart and how employees move through the organization. And he created the following really fascinating data viz tool. At the center is the CEO. And you can slow this down, you can zoom in, you can zoom out, but the different colors respond to different departments and different types of movement. Leaving the organization in a reorg would contain a different color. Now, as someone who's designed thousands of HR and payroll reports in my consulting career before I wrote and speak, I can tell you that I never designed anything remotely like this. This invites the type of data discovery that more and more companies are using to build a culture of analytics. Again, IT should not serve as the primary report builder. It should not be in the middle of every transaction. Going back then to Netflix data credo, allowing employees to discover things. It's never been easier to pull in data from APIs, to let application programming interfaces, to let employees discover things on their own. They understand the need of breaking down data silos. My friend Tony Fisher used to work at SAS, and about four or five years ago, he wrote a very interesting book called The Data Asset. And in it, he cited the statistic that it takes the average company, get this, roughly two weeks to put together a comprehensive and accurate list of their customers. Two weeks. You think it takes that long for Amazon, even though it has 300 million customers? I don't think so. It's never been more important to find new data sources and integrate them in to your analytics. What types of information would complement or augment your understanding of your employees, your customers, your users, and your products? And many times those data sources don't lie underneath the walls of your company. Right? They could be social data sources like LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. They could be open data sources, right? publicly available information to use however you like. It's never been more dangerous to view analytics as discrete, one-time projects. What works now doesn't necessarily work in six months. Maybe the market has changed. Maybe other people have caught up to you. It's never been more dangerous to adopt a mindset of set it and forget it. And I saw this many times in my consulting career. I'd say, well, the new system gives you all this new information. And they'd say, I don't care. I need the old report exactly the way I need it. They didn't want to go where the data could potentially take them. And when I talk about what companies like Google can do or Netflix or Amazon, it's very easy for some people to be a little intimidated, right? Netflix knows when I'm pausing. Well, it couldn't necessarily do that five or 10 years ago. Anyone use Google's autocomplete functionality? How to write a book. Before you get to write, once you type in W, Google's figuring out that you want to type in how to write a book. Google couldn't do those things five or 10 years ago. And in five or 10 years, Google will be able to do things that it cannot do today. Now, I'd like to spend a few minutes providing some lessons from my most recent book, Message Not Received. And as a big fan of quotes, this is one of my favorites from Bernard Baruch, who is an American financier, philanthropist, and political consultant. 
the ability to express an idea is well nigh as important as the idea itself. It's one thing if you have the right answer, but can you communicate that to people in a way that they would understand, in a way that doesn't make them feel confused or silly? I don't believe that there's such a thing as an email conversation. I know we all like email, and there are a bunch of reasons that it's become the de, the de facto means of communicating. But there are limitations to what email can do. For instance, my first talk on this new book took place about six months ago in San Francisco. And the company that brought me in said, we really need to talk to you. I said, OK, why is that? And they told me the story about how, for two years, people in San Francisco and people in England went back and forth over a thorny data issue. As someone who knows a thing or two about data from his consulting days, I can guarantee you that some data issues are so complex that it may, in fact, take two years to resolve. But the way these people were trying to solve the problem was totally inefficient. They kept emailing back and forth, and not, not only not solving the problem, but serving to annoy each other. When those people finally got together at a conference, not unlike this one, that problem that took two years to solve really took an hour. Oh, you meant this. I thought you meant that. So there are limitations to what email can do. It's never been more important to pick up the phone and embrace in-person communication. Right? Again, this isn't 1998, whether it's an internal collaboration tool or Skype or Google Hangouts. We miss so much when we're just sending texts. Text-based communication from the research I did for this book is only effective about 56% of the time. We often miss out on the tone. Is someone being serious? Is someone being funny? Is someone really angry? In fact, this has happened many times over my career. I, I thought that I was being clear. Who doesn't? But oftentimes, email just isn't the right tool. I don't think there is such a thing as a conversation over email. In-person com in communication might not be convenient, because you have to set it up, but sometimes it really is the most effective way. In fact, I abide by a three email rule. After three, I like to pick up the phone. The word communicate mean, means to make common. It's never been more important to remember this. You have to understand your audience. Are you making things common with other people? Some of us are statisticians and some of us aren't. Typically, most people won't understand if you're not a statistician what a P level is or a T test. Clearly define your terms. I'm amazed at how infrequently this happens. I went to a conference in New York a year ago for one of my clients. I didn't go um, to speak. I went as a member of the media to cover it. I write for Huffington Post and Wired and a few other outlets. And about an hour in of a, to a talk of a senior person, she kept using these acronyms, ABC and XYZ. And finally, I said, I, I don't. I can't follow. I raised my hand, and about 200 people looked at me when I asked, what do ABC and XYZ mean? She answered the question. I received a few puzzled looks from the audience, and then we went back to talking. Around two hours later, I was on the lunch line, and a few people started pointing at me and walking in my direction. And I thought, uh-oh, didn't take too long for me to take somebody off. They said, you're that guy who asked the question, right? I said, yeah. That, yeah, we didn't know what they were either. And I said, oh, are you with the media? Which outlets? So, no, 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 we're employees of this company. <laughs> so what are the odds that you're going to be able to successfully communicate? And this brings to me one of my favorite quotes. This one's actually on the jacket of the book. George Bernard Shaw, the Irish playwright and co-founder of the London School of Economics, said that the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that has taken place. We often forget that other people don't know what we know. Has anyone ever heard of the curse of knowledge? This happens to all of us. It's so easy for us to forget that other people just don't have our backgrounds. They don't spend their days working in a particular application or analyzing an industry. This happens to everyone, and it isn't necessarily out of being arrogant. I remember that when I did this gig six months ago, I asked my client if he wanted to see the galley of the book, because it hadn't been released yet. And I've written seven books. I know what a galley is. His response, what's a galley? It happens to everyone. A galley is just the PDF that becomes the book, but I forgot that. So you never want to forget your audience. Where are we going from here? What's next? Here's just some brief thoughts on the future. What does a future of analytics and data pretend? Anyone recognize this guy? 
Mark Andreessen. For those of you who don't know, he currently runs one of the most influential Silicon Valley venture capital firms, Andreessen Horowitz. But I guarantee that many, in the, many of you in the room have used his software because he created a little something called Mosaic, which was the first widely distributed web browser back in 1994, 1995. And when asked during a recent interview, what's next? He flat out said, I don't know. But it's not going to be another social network. It's not going to be another search engine. But what's the future of data and analytics? As I conclude and take a few questions, I'd argue that the chasm between companies that have built cultures of analytics and those that haven't will only continue to widen. And data and analytics will become more important in the future. Or if you like, what's the future of data and analytics? In a word, more. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Here's how you get in touch with me. And damn it, Jeff, you stole this one from me, too. You stay classy, San Diego.